Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar called uh, Engineering Graduates for Industry, the Educator's Perspective. Uh, my name is Jack Trithui, and I am the uh, Outreach Coordinator for the IMECI Yorkshire Humber Process Industries Division. Uh, today, we're joined by Professor Eleanor Rodriguez Falcon, Dr. Uh, Vinesh Thiruvalkum, and our main, um, as our main speakers, with Jacob Whittle, Murat Islam, and Professor Stuart Scott as our panelists. Uh, they'll introduce themselves more formally in due course. Um, so the layout of this webinar will uh, consist of two short presentations on the skills gap given from uh, Eleanor and Vinesh, followed by a Q&A session between the audience and the panelists. So uh, please, if you have any questions at all throughout um, the presentations, please do submit them and we will get to discussing them at the end. Um, so for the time being, I shall now pass over to Elena just to introduce herself quickly. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Elena Rodriguez Falcon and I'm president and CEO of NMI, the new model Institute for Technology and Engineering. I'll tell you more about it in a moment. Thank you. Um, so I'll now pass over to Jacob to introduce himself. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Jacob, uh, and I've just finished my Master's in Mechanical Engineering uh, at the University of Sheffield, uh, and I'm now going on to do a PhD uh, in Sheffield as well. Thank you. Uh, I'll now pass over to Murat, just to give a quick introduction. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am Murat Islam. I'm a chartered engineer with the IMEC. I'm currently working as a mechanical engineer in power transmission couplings, research and product development department at John Crane in Manchester. I'm actively volunteering across the IMEC Northwestern region at various committees, also representing the process industries division at the young members board. I have about over 10 years experience in lean manufacturing and product design in the UK. Thank you. And now if we could hear from Vinesh. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vinesh uh, Chalbam. I'm a professor and the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Chief Innovation Officer at Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, uh, quite a distance away in Malaysia. Uh, I have uh, been involved with IMACI for more than a decade now. Uh, I currently sit as the Vice Chair for the International Strategy Board and also in numerous boards within IMACI and very happy to be part of the session today today. Thank you. Thanks, Finish. And finally, if we could just hear from Stuart. Hi everyone, I'm Stuart Scott. I work in the engineering department at the University of Cambridge where I'm the course director for the Energy Technologies MPhil, as well as being involved in various other aspects of teaching. Uh, I'm also a chartered chemical engineer, um, so not really a an I'm a key person, but I sit on the process industry board. Great, thank you very much. Um, so now I think if it's okay with Eleanor, we'd like to pass over to her to hear from her presentation. Of course, let me just share my slides. Please tell me if you cannot see them. I hope you can. Uh, someone say yes, please. Yes, all good, can see them. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, uh, good morning, as I said, my name is Elena Rodriguez Falcon and I'm president and CEO of NMIT, uh, as I explained, is the new Model Institute for Technology and Engineering, which is a new higher education provider in Hereford. Uh, we created this institute to disrupt engineering education and to mind the engineering skills gap, which is what we are here uh, to talk about today. The next 10 minutes or so, I will cover briefly how NMIT responded to employers and stakeholders to address the skills gap uh, identified some years ago, um, but also what current research commissioned by NMIT says regarding what we should be focusing on uh, for in terms of future skills, but also as a result of the COVID effect. So just briefly, um, employers, parents, children, educators, the government indeed, concluded uh, that engineering gra graduates were lacking the work readiness needed to hit the ground running the way they put it. Um, they said that engineers lack the ability and creativity to solve problems to some extent, um, and, and that 
perhaps there was opportunities to develop the ability to work with people from other disciplines and and something that is i think very palpable that there is still opportunity to increase that diversity of engineers so nmite as a result um, developed an accelerated image in integrated engineering program to to try to address this feedback uh, integrating engineering from various disciplines to start with but also with li liberal subjects to provide the contextualization and, and to respond to that uh, feedback that we need to be able to work with people from other disciplines it is a program that is based completely on learning by doing using authentic problems projects from industry real customers throughout the whole of the program, which, as I said, is accelerated from four years as an MH to three years, giving the, the future engineer the experience of so solving numerous problems and the work readiness that we, we were told we lacked. The program is assessed by portfolio so that they can evidence not just uh, what they know, but also what they can do. And in authentic spaces, reflecting the way of work and during office hours, nine to five, five days a week, giving the, the student the experience of, of being employed. So we just started this year. We welcomed the first group of uh, students at NMIT, and I'll be able to share how that's going uh, in a few months' time. But just turning back to future skills, the question that we have been asking ourselves is, have we gone far enough to address the engineering skills gap of the future. Uh, we asked representatives of 15 different institutions and conducted an employability skills audit with 44 uh, partners. And this is what we found. They said that in the next 10 years, they expect the following major changes. Uh, the need for enhanced data skills, which I don't think is a surprise to anyone. Uh, and also, of course, closer co connections between education and industry. And that's something, it's a, it's a theme that comes back again and again. They also said that there is a need for common universal skills language. I read these but personally as being able to move from discipline to discipline uh, and maybe more controversially doing away with disciplines altogether, question mark. They also said that it's important that, that there is agility in roles, tumbling of barriers between those roles and that we should focus on competencies and capabilities rather than, than roles. I think, once again, focusing on skills rather than functions. And a realization that qualifications need to reflect this. And this is how we, we need to think very hard as educators. How do we respond to this feedback? After we did this research, COVID hit the world. And, and we asked ourselves the question, what is the COVID effect on on all of this, really. So we commissioned some research conducted by Census Wide in, in June 2021, 20, just recently, with 1,016 to 18-year-olds and 1,000 parents. And the first thing that, which I haven't included in my slides, but has been widely reported on, is that in light of the COVID pandemic, more 16 to 18 years olds were going to study higher education. And, and we've seen that that's that's true. Uh, but we also uh, found, not surprisingly, thinking about the future challenges, that given the COVID pandemic, medical careers were cited as the most future proof of careers, uh, with 24% of parents saying that and 17% uh, of the 16 to 18 years old. Yet there was also a certain level of belief that no career can be truly future proof. Interestingly, even post COVID pandemic, 17% of the, of the 16 to 18 years old value the chance to work on tackling some of the world's biggest problems such as climate change compared to just 9% of, of the parents. And 25% of those young people uh, and 18% of the parents want a career that enables them to help uh, others which I think is, is a, a, a theme and a, and a trend that we are seeing more and more. And more than half of, of both groups uh, do not know someone who's an engineer, which is, I think, importantly in terms of role modeling. 
when making choices for higher education for the 16 to 18 years old survey, the subjects available to study uh, and location were the most important factors for, for that group of people. But for parents, uh, they consider the career's prospects on graduation more important, followed closely by, by the subjects available to study. But when it comes to the reality of a career, parents survey think that job satisfaction is more important with absolute 70% is huge versus less than half of 16 to 18 years old who actually feel that the most important factor is to have a, a good work-life balance. So all of this is so important because when then you look at what employers are looking for, which is really interesting, is that uh, employers think of skills and attributes and the research we conducted amongst our partners, and we have a, a very large group of industrial partners, is that they mostly value highly creative problem solving, 85%, closely followed by real world experience, and please keep that in mind for a moment, and initiative with 81% when looking at, at their future uh, recruits. Uh, equally, creative problem solving was of uh, importance both to parents and to, and to the 16 to 18 years old, also followed by communication, resilience, critical thinking, and emotional intelligence. And interestingly, almost half of the 16 to 18 years old consider real world experience as important to employers versus only 38% of parents. And, and this is really, really important. I'll, I'll be concluding uh, soon. Uh, but what I, I want to draw attention to all of this is that technical skills have not been mentioned in any of these um, conversations, not, not years ago, not now. So that's something to keep in mind for the conversation that we are going to have later. So just, just let me summarize uh, what I think we heard. Uh, and begin to see that it's not just a set of skills, as I said, technical particularly, but also at attributes and experiences that we need to focus on, including developing leaders with a passion to discover. This is this is an interpretation from NMI particularly. Uh, engineers who create positive change in society, who process more than technical skills and are able to communicate with diverse, diverse audiences, if not fluently, easily and who consider not only technical requirements, but who respond to legal, ethical, and business needs. And of course, are creative in a world of very limited resources, and that, that's happening more and more. And who essentially uh, represent social responsibility. Uh, engineers for foreign might are not only those who know what they need to, to do and how, but they also know why and can do and will do something about it. So uh, my conclusion of all of this is that, of course, there is a, a, an engineering skills gap, but perhaps is very much uh, on our attributes rather than on the skills. And, and there, is, there is clear evidence that we, uh, that we can do something about it. And I can tell you more about what we've done at might. I think it's 10 minutes, so I'll stop and uh, we can talk about it in a minute. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that, Eleanor. Um, so again, I'd just like to encourage all the members of the audience, if you have any questions throughout, to uh, submit them as attendee questions and we'll get through to them later. Um, so now if uh, we could pass over to uh, Vinesh, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing his screen to give his presentation, that would be great. Thank you, Jack. Uh, let me get my slides out. Can I check whether you can see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening again, everyone uh, from Malaysia. So uh, it's evening here in Malaysia. Let me just take you on a, on a short journey of uh, what I take uh, as in the 
educators' perspective towards uh, fresh graduates coming out uh, for the industry. Uh, having been in the education scene for over a decade and also in the industry for uh, more than one and a half decades before that, uh, I bring and I've seen uh, the differences between uh, the graduates that are coming out and the practicality of the utilization of the graduates in the industry. Uh, it is very much uh, changes over the years. Yeah, it has changed over the years. I also sit as the uh, vice chair as the uh, on the uh, IMACI's International Strategy Board, so I see graduates from different uh, areas around the world, and I've seen how they have gone from from a student into the uh, uh, capacity of uh, working in the current industry and being part of the workforce. So if you take a, a typical uh, mechanical engineering journey, uh, this is what you see as a, as a mapping uh, from your first year to your final year. And you see that what has actually happens is five primary areas of development. Uh, you get to navigate through your coursework uh, that's where you learn the fundamentals. Uh, that is where you learn the core uh, of engineering uh, within any of your disciplines or programs. In those four years, you also develop skills. Uh, this comes with the experience of some of the practical skills that you develop uh, and taking on the knowledge that you get from the fundamentals onto the actual uh, usage of those uh, fundamentals onto project development, for example. Vinesh, if you don't mind me, cutting here would you be able to put your presentation on presentation mode we can only see your powerpoint slides with the with the previews at the side not the actual presentation thank you okay Is it better now? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. So let me just continue. Uh, so the third part is actually to seek connections. And this is where you get into uh, involvement with the industry, uh, becoming uh, members of certain uh, professional body chapters within the institution. And this is where you start to connect as well. Uh, you start to network. Uh, you start to engage. Now, the fourth area is actually to broaden your perspectives in terms of where you want to be uh, when you finish uh, your, your degree. And lastly, uh, going beyond your actual curriculums and how you upskill yourselves while being at the university. Now, these uh, five areas uh, are in development mode in your four-year journey. Yeah, This gets you uh, ready uh, in terms of profiling yourself, which is very important uh, because when you come out, you actually come out very similar to the person next to you. Uh, you guys have taken the same subjects, you've taken the same courses, the same assessments, potentially done some of the same projects. But what makes you different is the profiling of yourself. Because when you go onto the workforce, uh, on your right, you will see a whole load of different opportunities uh, for a typical mechanical engineer. And they also uh, form the same opportunities for other disciplines. How do you profile yourself towards getting into the workforce and then sustaining yourself into the workforce is of primary importance to you. Now, in this current era of digitization, uh, the digitization of engineering uh, presents an immense uh, benefit uh, to a lot of the companies out there. So digitization of engineering together with the Industrial Revolution 4.0 uh, definitely strikes a big tick in the box for productivity and performance. And all new graduates uh, or young graduates for that matter who are already in the workforce will be exposed to uh, digitization of engineering. Now, mechanical engineering or any engineering for that matter uh, has been progressing steadily in this, uh, in this front of uh, digitization. Uh, essential functions of its value uh, chain uh, are increasingly uh, being digitized, uh, thus enhancing uh, the industry's product uh, portfolio. So a lot of new products that are coming out there uh, based on the evolving uh, areas of ICT and uh, the digital world itself. Uh, a lot of those functionalities uh, are part of the new innovations that are coming out. A lot of it is data-driven uh, as part of uh, the services and also as part of product development. 
And, and this is now a, a new norm. Uh, it is not something that is going to change. That is there for sure. So what I've highlighted here is, is, is basically just summarized to six uh, of the core areas that are, are tackling uh, the digitization that is happening in the engineering workforce. Now, the first area is robotics. And, you know, robotics doesn't cover your conventional robots or types of different robots that you use in terms of humanoids and things like that. Now it's gone to the next level of uh, autonomous rovers, uh, drones application. Uh, drones are being used in, a, in, in so many ways that it's also benefiting society in terms of the type of data that you can collect uh, using drones. Uh, the next is the automation. Uh, and when you talk about automation, automation has been there in the manufacturing sector for a long time. But what is coming now in, in a deep impact is the, uh, the influence of AI. Uh, the artificial intelligence is beginning to impact not only manufacturing, but also other sectors like construction and, and building services. And when you go, when you take automation uh, and the use of AI, you are not only using AI as an as a enabler, but you're also using AI in terms of uh, data collection uh, and also the enabling of the data to do uh, rapid responses uh, to any form of automation uh, within any industry. Now, the third part is 3D printing. Now, 3D printing started off as something which was fun to do, but 3D printing has gone now, uh, taking itself from rapid prototyping, uh, prototyping to into the next uh, linear uh, versions of uh, manufacturing. Uh, we've also gone into 4D printing for that matter, uh, whereby now it is not so rigid. There is also flexibility in terms of the products that are being pulled out from uh, the outcomes of 3D printing. Then you have autonomous vehicles, and this is now uh, already on the roads. Yeah, we have uh, cars which are smart enough to detect accidents, to detect, detect curbs and stuff like that. But it's going on to the next stage whereby energy uh, in terms of uh, the usage of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the resources to run vehicles are, are going to take place uh, in terms of the usage of autonomous vehicles. Uh, the next one is unmanned aerial uh, vehicles that is similar to robotics where we are going now into the area of drones. Uh, we have used drones for so many purposes. Uh, we've uh, recently uh, also I've been working on projects where drones have been used uh, in a very practical way, whereby it's not only for GPS mapping and stuff like that or image capturing, uh, but we're also using it for, uh, for CSI, a crime scene investigation, which is a different uh, perspective to the usage of drones. Yeah, and, and lastly is VR AR. Now VR AR is not a new term, uh, uh, especially now when we're starting to use the term XR, which is uh, extended reality. But it's part of uh, spatial computing, which is actually going to serve a purpose uh, in terms of also education, but also in terms of construction. Uh, there are a lot of good examples out there with the application of VR AR or XR for that matter in terms of time scaling your, your construction, uh, replica your, your construction based on previous constructions that have been done, whereby you can improve your timing based on, on some of this uh, 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 usage of uh, VR, AR. The other area which is important for everyone, and it's now being deeply driven uh, in a lot of the curriculums, but also in the workforce uh, based on commitment. A commitment towards uh, sustainable development goals, yeah, the SDGs. So within the SDGs, there's 17 goals. And whatever you do uh, in the workforce, you will be indirectly or directly uh, addressing these goals. Um, and a lot of it has got to do with the type of uh, work that you do. So if you're in engineering, you, you're definitely going to be uh, uh, in some product development, some design work, in some form of construction, some form of maintenance, some form of um, developments that are going to improve your uh, productivity, for example, in manufacturing and things like that. And, and these cover a lot of these areas within the 17 uh, SDG goals. Yeah, uh, There's a lot of work being done to improve uh, and benefit society. And with the current pandemic, these are even more important uh, to be uh, to be there as not only as information, but at the back of your mind, whenever you de design, create, or ideate anything, you are always thinking of something which is beneficial to society. And, and, the, and, and the, there's enough information and references uh, for SDG for you to refer to whereby you can get insights to what has been done and what needs to be done uh, in the coming future. And this is a worldwide uh, application. Uh, it's not only in any part of the region to be specific, but it happens around the world. So what do employers want? 
So employers, they, they, they focus on a lot of uh, uh, skills which are not actually taught uh, while you're in the university. But a lot of universities as part of the curriculum are now starting to deploy these skills as part of it being embedded in a lot of the work that is done in, done in the university. Now, a lot of employers uh, definitely want people to be able to work in teams. Yeah. Now, with, with even if you work online uh, remotely, but somehow or other you need to connect uh, with your team members in, in a group. Yeah. You cannot develop anything on your own. You will be definitely working in a group. The second thing is communications. Yeah, you, we, we used to speak about public speaking and how to speak up uh, in terms of face-to-face. Uh, -face. But now, at this current stage, a lot of communications are going on remotely. So communicating in a remote manner is not as exactly similar to communicating in a face-to-face -face manner. And how you, you develop your communication skills uh, remotely is, is, is vital towards the, the coming future. You must have that drive and resilience. You must be patient. Uh, a lot of the young graduates are not patient. Uh, they're always looking for something new. They're looking for a fast change. So likewise, your upskilling and your knowledge improvement has to be as fast as your desire and your drive and resilience. So you must have that balance between what you want to do, what you're aiming to do, what you're forecasting for yourself, and put that into your drive and resilience. Uh, there is a lot of uh, engineers that lack commercial finance uh, uh, knowledge, but understanding geopolitics, understanding economic differences uh, within the regions in the world also applies to different commercial uh, knowledge that you need in terms of some of the projects you're going to be involved with. And understanding finance is very, very important because engineers always lack information of finance. The other thing is, Thinking outside the box. Now, challenge yourself. Think outside the box. The only way you can come up with something innovative and ideate a new uh, product is to always think outside the box. So challenge yourself in terms of challenge thinking. Go into the digital world. Apply digital thinking thoughts. Yeah, uh, You have to develop new skills. Learning never stops. You will always have to learn new skills because technology is the main reason why you will have to develop new skills. As, as new technology, uh, new tool sets appear, you will have to pick them up. You have to have a self-awareness of where you are and what you want to do in the, in the coming future. So knowing what you're good at, what you're passionate about is important. While you're out there in the workforce, start building your professional network. Join iMackie, for example. Join any professional body for that matter. It allows you to be within a network. It allows you to connect with people. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, downside to the engineering uh, profession. A lot of people don't want to do engineering anymore because they, they find it too long, too cumbersome, too mathematical. And, and that's the dilemma in the STEM world, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But we should be passionate. We should be proud of our engineering uh, profession and spread that, that respect for the profession and become an ambassador for all engineers. Yeah? Uh, lastly, the willingness to sort of uh, be part of this engineering profession is something that stays with you uh, as you move on and you will continue to connect with different professionals uh, in the coming industry. Always keep these connections uh, with you because you never know when you will need them again. So networking is a very important part of engineering and, and keep that passion for engineering going. Yeah. So thank you. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. And thanks to both of you. Um, that was, both of them were really, really interesting to watch. And so now we're actually going to move into the uh, Q&A parts of the um, webinar. Um, so the first thing um, that I wanted just to ask everybody, uh, maybe the other panelists, is just do they have any thoughts or comments on, on what they've heard and seen so far? Maybe I can start. 
Um, I found both presentations were like quite informative, and um, I am totally agreeing with what Vinesh actually put down on his um, what do employers want. Actually, I, I totally agree with all those statements. And every time I I see a new graduate, I see the lack of all those things that you mentioned. Actually, so that that tells me there is a lot of skills gap. And um, obviously, Elena has mentioned that. The good work she's putting in there. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the future and what these two companies will actually achieve and maybe the partnership between the Young Members Board to put something together maybe in the future. Can I uh, also say, I think the, the NMIT approach is, is incredibly innovative. And one of the things that we need to be careful of as educators in university is that we understand who should be teaching what and what the learning outcome should be. So we have, in one role, we, we teach technical stuff. We, we give lectures on maths and science and the physics of engineering. Um, and it was interesting that the employers just seem to take that as granted, that all our engineers are all really good. And so one view is they don't value it. Another is that we're doing our jobs properly, that our, our engineers, our graduates are brilliant people, and we're doing the job we should do. The question is, is it our role to provide the training that employers want and to what extent should we do that? So I would give the, the sort of example that is it our job to teach computer programming or is it our job to teach a specific language? You know, it should be teaching them about a specific kind of pump or all kinds of pumps and fluid mechanics. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think the NMIT approach addresses that because what you do in that approach is you have the teaching of the fundamentals, but the learning is through the experience, the things that you don't get in lectures, is by working with the equipment. So I think that that's probably the way forward. I suspect in Cambridge we we err towards the, the lectures and the, the technical content, um, but I think in future we're going to have to go towards the NMI type approach a little bit more. Great. If there are if there are no um, additional comments, I will move on to um, some of the attendee questions. Now, we've got um, quite a few of these. So um, the first one um, is actually um, directed at uh, Vinesh. So I'll ask it to Vinesh uh, first, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the um, panel to discuss it. And it's um, how can uh, educational institutions uh, bridge the gap between students and industries other than uh, sending students to summer jobs or internships? Are there alternative methods of doing that? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good question because uh, what we have been preaching, uh, especially at my institution and a lot of the institutions uh, that I know of internationally, is to bring industry onto campus. And that's a, a, a very important uh, way forward. Uh, the industry is busy. Uh, they don't have time, but they definitely need graduates. Uh, but industry being on campus comes in so many forms. Uh, a lot of the universities in this region where I am at have industry advisory panels, which meet once, twice a year. They oversee the curriculum. They give insights into what is lacking, what are the new uh, uh, hiring trends, uh, where do the graduates are deployed uh, in the workforce within any specific industry. And that's important. The second is to, to work uh, on two, two methods. Yeah? One is to work with the uh, universities or any of the faculties via projects uh, which are given to the students, giving them, a, giving them a chance to develop prototypes on a trial and this uh, trial and error basis. Uh, thirdly is to push out research uh, into the universities, uh, which is very, very important. And as a trend over the last uh, decade is there are a lot of industries and a lot of these uh, large companies that are developing their own research centers. But back in the days, the research centers used to sit in the universities and that, that is now changing. So you've got a, a sort of imbalance and a, a redundancy of research that is going on in the university and also research that is going on at the industries. Uh, by virtue of keeping it at the university and coming onto campus, you're actually working with the academics and the top talents uh, to produce research but then now with this research uh, centers that are evolving in the industry sort of creates this imbalance and also lack of support towards academic research. Yeah, yeah so that's a couple of my points on that question. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm now going to open that question um, up to the rest of the up to the rest of the uh, panel. Um, but just as a refresher, I will ask it again um, if I can find it. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So the question was: um, How can educational institutions bridge the gap between students and industries, other than sending students to summer jobs or internships? So, does anybody else have any additional comments? Uh, I'll be happy to take that, Jack. Um, given that the program that we have here and the model of education at NMIS is all about engaging with industry and, and as um, as you was saying, without that engagement, this program actually doesn't work. So, reaching that interaction is, I mean, it, it serves various purposes, but if you think about providing um, our students with the exposure to new techniques, uh, the skills that the employers need, but also, of course, the vehicle to learning, um, having that, those interactions either on campus as part of the, uh, of the program, or equally outside campus within the, their their industries is is of course very important that the preaching word in the question is is interesting because it's about facilitating that interaction and students will find it more challenging because they don't have the connection so that that is our job to some extent particularly if the program demands it like ours but i think there is another point that i i think I, i'll make and then i stop because um, Stuart and, and Murat will have other views. But um, I think the, the opportunity that, that, that breaching those relationships between industry and, and higher education that brings to the future engineer is immense in terms of facilitating or brokering future employment. So you are exposing the engineer, the future engineer, to uh, an extended interview nearly, in our case, a, a three-year extended interview because there'll be so many companies involved. So uh, those are just um, top of my head uh, thoughts, but I, I would put most of the uh, responsibility on, on us as educators, uh, given that we are in the facilitative uh, driving seat. I think I was going to agree entirely with all those points. I think where, the way we do it is through projects. Um, and if you think about the skills that you're uh, bridging to industry, one of the things that you do in an academic context is you often give students problems to which you know the answer. So you, it's slightly lazy of us as educators. We give a problem that's a model problem. And then the students, when they come to try and apply this, discover that the model problem was the one case. It was very easy. And, uh, and where you get around that is in the projects where you give students problems that are uh, difficult and it's the, really the only way to teach the critical thinking problem solving skill that was highlighted in the presentation because it's not something you can teach in a lecture, you can only teach it by having a problem that's difficult and working through it as a team and a group of people and getting feedback. And I think industry brings problems, but I think in general, just doing project-based work where the students don't know the answer is it's more expensive from an, from an educator's point of view because we have to put in a lot more effort but the value is much greater to the students um, and what industry brings if you can engage them is they they add a huge amount to the problems that can be addressed and also uh, giving the students a flavor of the sort of methods that are used to solve things So yeah, you made a very interesting yeah. point, if, if, if I may contribute to that one, actually. You mentioned that um, giving the students like solved problems, isn't it? Um, it is something industry doesn't want to do. They want mm -hmm. to have something unknown to be learned in the academia and they capture that information and use it as their own in a way, get all the patent rights or uh, data rights or usage rights for it rather than giving it to the whole public back again. It doesn't interest the industry enough, I don't think, to give the academia the problems that are already solved. So that, that makes it a difficult thing to actually collaborate then, um, doesn't it? Uh, I would disagree just briefly because I think um, there are two reasons why you would, as industry, engage with higher education. One is to get a, a solution for your problem 
and one is to get talent. And if what you want is to get talent that is adaptable, flexible, responsive, and all of the things we just talked about, um, facilitating that education is actually a worthwhile investment. If what you're looking for is an answer, maybe the, the, the route forward is postgraduate education and PGR particularly. But undergraduate education, I would think it is about the talent. Right, I just want to um, move the uh, conversation on, if that's okay, and actually um, try and get um, Jacob's perspective here. So I've got I've got a question which is um, more tailored towards uh, Jacob, but again, people are welcome to jump in at any point. So uh, Jacob, just I just wanted to know really that as a recent sort of graduate from um, your university degree in mechanical engineering, are there any features that your degree education you think it might have lacked in accessing, uh, addressing the skills gap? Is there anything that you would have liked to have seen? Maybe more industry connection, maybe more hands-on work, maybe more um, connection with employers? Uh, yeah, um, I was actually just about to um, uh, connect to the last question. Actually, I was about to say that Sheffield, I think Sheffield actually, as a traditional university, actually uh, facilitates uh, industrial connection really well um uh, in a similar in a similar manner to, to what Stuart was just uh discussing through projects um and yeah I, I actually think that the way the way it's done there's you know multiple projects uh throughout the undergraduate um uh course um led led by industry uh with with problems that they have um that they know the answers to and want to see how people respond to them and, and how they get to the answer or come up with a different answer um so yeah, actually, I would I would say that I, I don't particularly feel like um, uh, anything was missing from that side of uh, of my education at Sheffield. No, that's fair enough. Okay, we'll move on to um, another quick. Now, there's a lot of quite wordy questions, so I'm not sure I'll be able to fit all of them in the remaining time that we've got. But I will give it a go. So again, um, I'll open this one up to the whole panel. Um, so the question is. Um, Existing academic staff often have limited industrial experience and heavy investment in the teaching of their disciplines. Uh, in addition, uh, curricula are already quite crowded. Um, so adding a new scope to student experience means cutting back elsewhere and brings considerable pressure onto existing staff. Um, so considering that, um, how best can change in academic education be brought about? I wasn't on mute there, no, not on mute. <laughs> I, I, inevitably, I, I want to answer the question, but I, I, I think uh, maybe people who are working in in higher education institutions with uh, the traditional way of uh, educating might be better placed, and I can add a perspective. So I'll, I'll wait. Well, I was, I was just going to start with, um, with, with that as, as a student. Um, Obviously, obviously, we all know that curricula curricula is crowded, as you say. Um, but uh, and perhaps this is just my personal approach to things. But uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, doing um, uh, activities outside of the curriculum, um, driven by myself and other people um, that don't involve academic input. Um, so that um, particularly, um, and I and I'm a key run competitor, or I'm a key facilitated competition. Um, called Railway Challenge, but there's also Formula Student, um, which people might have heard of. Um, and uh, doing that and, and knowing people that, that do do the other projects as well, um, actually, it is the best way um, for, you know, I think it's the, the best addition to student experience without, uh, without taking anything away from, from the curriculum that, that exists. I mean, it's the best exponent and the best way of of practicing those skills and, and gaining new skills uh, that employers uh, seem to so desperately want um, in a traditional sense anyway, uh, a traditional university. Uh, obviously, Elena has a... Uh, I, would, I would just ask a question back to, to everyone. Does it need to be crowded? And I think that's, that's the question. Does it, in the first place, need to have everything that is there? And could 
just for a moment, reimagine our, imagine ourselves being in a position where if you had the opportunity to do it all over again and you had a blank piece of paper, what would you leave? What would you lose? And how would you do it differently? And I don't want to answer that question because I think there are many ways in, of doing that. But perhaps just the, the challenge to ourselves as educators is uh, being honest with what really needs to be there uh, so that we make not a space for what needs now to come in, but to do it uh, in in line with how world it, the world is moving. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Uh, maybe I can add a few uh, few cents to this. Uh, I think uh, in, in curriculums or any of the programs, uh, we are bounded by compliances. Uh, I think in the UK, you have the QAA and in Malaysia, we've got the professional bodies. And now uh, with the Washington Accord, uh, with everyone being a signatory to the Washington Accord, there again, you've got a sort of a body of knowledge which is fixed uh, and where you have to adhere and comply to. I think that is the issue because your, your journey uh, for your programs, you have a maximum of four years. And to to take on board everything which is stipulated as a subject to be taken is the difficult uh, area. If you ask me, engineering is not the toughest uh, toughest uh, 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 discipline to overcome these compliances. I think the ICT industry, uh, computing and, and all the new digital programs, they, they have a bigger dilemma in this because you have a set of, of subjects that you need to take and then uh, you also have all these evolving new technologies and, and, and type of areas that are demanding from the industry. So the industry comes in and says, we need the graduates to be of, of a certain caliber, to have certain knowledge and skills. But then you only have room for four years. Uh, and in that four years, you have got your, your, your fundamentals, you've got your core, you've got your common core, and you also have your university uh, uh, common subjects that as a university, you have certain subjects that are across the board for all sub, uh, all programs. So to, to massage all of this into a four-year curriculum, it is it is tough, uh, but but we are getting there, uh, but but we, we need to evolve. And you know, back in the days, curriculums used to be fixed and it, it doesn't change for a couple of years. But nowadays it changes almost every year, quite annually, a lot of changes and amendments are happening. Yeah, I'll pass it on to another person. So uh, one thing I'd like to add here is, and, and maybe we'll come to this, but the COVID experiment, you might call it. I mean, it's been the largest experiment in education since, well, ever, in that we've had to massively change over how we were educating. And it not everything we have done has been bad in this, uh, in this experiment. Many of the things we've done have might facilitate this in that, it's hard to remove things, but there are things we do that are inefficient. So what you might call, uh, you know, lecture material where you just project information at people. I strongly suspect that the students uh, found that having recorded lectures that they can view at their own pace uh, in their own time and really digest information was a much more efficient way of learning that information. And then having interactions with staff where you ask questions and solve problems in this kind of flip lecture mode means that you're addressing some of the you're not uh, you're addressing the students need to solve problems instead of just spending your time projecting the information at them and so there's something i think there's going to be a big change in how we do things going forward i don't know where it will go but i think we'll see a, a freeing up of some space in the curriculum uh based on switching based on going to this kind of online um lecturing type mode but i think the we must view that as an opportunity to do more education, not to reduce academic workload. I think there's a view that you might be doing it to kind of just avoid giving your lectures. Um, you know, if I've done this same lecture every year for six years or 10 years, as I've done in Cambridge, um, you think, why am I doing this? Why don't I record it and not have to go give the same lecture every year? And the answer is yes, I, why do the same lecture every year? But equally, if I've then got that time freed up, I can use, we should be using that time to do more interactive sessions. And I think where the students get the most value is when they can ask horrible questions that make our, that make your brain melt as a lecturer. And you find yourself stumbling in front of them and having to work through a real problem with them and explain something to them. And it, it's, 
both terrifying as an academic, but I think useful for the students to see that kind of less polished, real world kind of thinking. Can I just add a, a, a comment? Um, professional engineering bodies and QAA and regulatory bodies are, are becoming much more flexible uh, and are open to alternative ways of doing things uh, and hence why organizations like and might exist. So I think it's important that we as educators explore those those options. And, and if you have an idea that you think, oh, this would be really exciting and worthwhile, and I'm doubtful whether my professional engineering body would allow it, uh, ask the question first, because I think uh, you'll be surprised. Great, thanks everybody. Um, I'm now um, I'm now actually going to read two um, two questions from two separate people, which actually one of them is a comment and one of them is a question, and they both seem to um, complement each other very well. So you might not have anything to comment on these, but I just think it's really important to get it out there into the conversation. So the first part from one person was um, so I was having this discussion just last night regarding how the comp um, how the company of oh, this person works at um, Rolls Royce, by the way. Um, how the company is putting a lot of emphasis on getting graduates with a 2-1 and first-class degrees, pushing them through fast-track processes to be leaders, but they don't get the time to learn the product, learn how to interact with the various functions, and ultimately tend to frustrate the time-served um, the time served population with their lack of true industry knowledge and personability to be a good team player or leader. Um, how do you think we can get companies to realise that we need people who can do the real job, rather than just the academics who can toe the line and regurgitate processes. So that is um, an observation and a question from the first comment. And then um, another comment, which I actually think answers this question, um, but they take it from a workload perspective, is on the uh, workload question, it's not about doing more, it's about focusing on the right things. We have focused uh, for, for many years on filling students' heads with as many facts and as much knowledge as we can. There um, is about a sh this is about a shift towards enabling students to think and behave like an engineer instead of focusing just on the amount of knowledge. With so much knowledge we could teach, we're only ever going to scratch the surface anyway. We need graduates who have fundamental knowledge and the right approach to finding and applying what they need to solve problems. So I think I think those two more or less outline what, what has been discussed so far. Um, are there any are there any comments from the panel on those two observations or we can move on to another question? Can I can I make a few comments on this one? I I always think engineers as people who like to do research and uh, find out new knowledge, new facts, and experiment with those and make them into products or some solutions to solve some simple or very big problems. So that tells me we don't have to know anything. We just need to know how to find out that information, how to conduct that research but have the basic fundamental knowledge of it to do a proper research, to, to sort of guide our research and use the right keywords, the right terminology to find out that information. Then we will be able to come up with those creative solutions that are not applied before, or maybe applied somewhere in a different way, but can be applied to a different application in a totally different way that takes it to a next level. So I think educators need to really think about giving those um, fact-finding skills, exploration, critical questioning skills, rather than um, giving them all the mathematical formulas and going through all the formulas step by step, because students should be able to do that in, in their own time if they wanted to learn more about the subject. So I think we should just lead the way in to them and tell them, look, this is an area, if you are interested in working in this area, do a little bit more research in this and guide them through it. And um, maybe just offer them some problems, uh, like Stuart mentioned there, that are quite interesting, challenging problems and work through those problems together and um, actually get the physical item in your hand. If you have a spring in a place, then, then show that spring, um, show the reacting forces. If you have a beam bending, then show them that bending actually, show, show how the displacements occur. But these are the mechanical design aspects. It's not just mechanical design. Mechanical engineering is about processes improving everything around us, 
including the environment. So climate change is something quite important these days. COP26 has come in. What are we doing about this? Uh, can, do we even teach anything about sustainability or environmental impact that we have with our designs or solutions? So all these things actually are important, but we don't have to give them exact answers. We don't. Need to, we just need to give them how to find the answers themselves, make them more critical. Can I contradict myself here? Um, I like that. Uh, so I, you know, I think the skills aspect and learning through experience is incredibly important. But I do think you need a baseline level of knowledge and. I think you do have to have done something really technically hard, no matter what it is. You learn how to learn something that's technically hard. And I think some of our education programs, it's not necessarily that we teach them lots of knowledge. It's the fact they've had to learn a lot of that knowledge. That it's prepared them and given the ability to then go into other areas and learn more knowledge. So I, I can sort of see the point that many of the things we teach are of no use, you know, in terms of the fact that was taught in that lecture. But the process they've gone through in that i think has some value saying that obviously there's a balance i think i'm going to blow our trumpet here in cambridge in that we have very short terms so we have only eight week terms and it forces us to not teach things so if we have a course that and i had experience at an american university where we did a, a four month semester we would cover the same material in eight weeks now clearly we don't cover the same material we it's pared down to the minimal and the assumption is that you can teach the basic skills the right fundamentals and then the students will be able to learn the rest of it themselves so there's a balance and we're, I, we we don't always get it right i mean we are forced into in our system we have these eight week terms so we kind of forced to condense things and do it this way but i think one of the things we're always currently asking ourselves at the moment is why am i teaching this so uh, and sustainability is a very good example of this because we i run an energy technologies master's course you have to be very careful about just filling your time with pictures of wind turbines. You know, what's the skill the students have learned? Are they learning fluid mechanics or have they just learned that a wind turbine is a wind turbine? And so you have to get away from the encyclopedia type approach and focus on the core bits. It's not easy to do, and I'm not saying we've necessarily got it right all the time, but it's something we're striving to do. Great, thank you. Gosh, we've got we've got so many um, interesting questions submitted, and it's just a shame that we're running out of time. But we will we will save these questions. Don't worry, and and um, we will uh, get to these at some point. So the uh, last question I want to ask is um, sort of puts um, traditional university assessment at odds with um, what industry desires. So again, it's quite a wordy question, and we'll just spend the last couple of minutes on this one, if that's okay. Uh, so this is a question from um, a lecturer at the University of Bath, and it says, um, I currently work at a UK university as a unit con con convener for a large group working project for a large group working project for students. As someone who used to work in industry recently, I value genuine team working skills as being highly desirable. And the IMECE, who accredit our course, stipulate that we must incorporate this into the degree program. It does, however, seem to be at odds with the faculty who value and push for individual differentiation in terms of skills and grades. Is there any comment on this or ideas how to address this balance, i.e. Um, would industry prefer being able to identify individual students quite clearly, uh, which gives more bias towards individual marks, or perhaps sacrifice that ability to differentiate so clearly, knowing that the students will have a more uh, team working skills? Uh, so more bias towards group marks. Uh, thank you for your time, he says. Quite a wordy question. <laughs> it, it is. Uh, if I, I'll, I mean, lo lo lots of good points there, because um, on the one hand, you are educating and have commitment and responsibility to the individual, but equally that means that you have to equip them with those skills. And, and I, I shared with you earlier that team working and, and Vinesh said the same is, is one of the most important attributes and skills that you, you, you need to have as an engineer. Um, and Mike's program is all throughout the whole program uh, with a few exceptions, teamwork based. It's not always teamwork assessed, and, and but a great deal of it is. And it is challenging because on the one hand, you want to enable the skill, 
but assessing teamwork can be very challenging and, and I, I've done it from, from a point of view of an educator in a Russell Group University and, and now at NMIT. And, and it is scary. And I think that that's the one thing that we need to reassure ourselves as educators and reassure the students as, as, as future engineers that um, working in, in teams and assessing in teams can be an imperfect uh, process and sometimes can lead to imperfect grades. And that's what becomes really scary because what you don't want is to say to the students, well, uh, mm, this, you, your grade, individual grade based on your group work is this, but you were let down because uh, the group didn't perform. What you do want to say is, what you took away from this is the ability to now be resilient, to be able to na navig navigate and negotiate those challenges that will happen in the real world, in the real world. So uh, I don't think I'm answering the, the question. What perhaps I'm saying is that uh, while scary, we ought to give it a go and not have just one or two projects inserted within the curriculum, but much more of it so that we can become better at it. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry to say that I think um, our, our time is up. Um, these, these webinars tend to fly by so quickly. Um, and what, what is good to see is that we've, you know, there, there's been so much engagement that we haven't actually been able to get through all the questions, which is actually a really good sign because it shows that there is further scope for a conversation on this area. Um, so before um, I, uh, we say goodbye, I'd just like to thank um, all the uh, presenters and panelists today for their contributions. Um, it's been really, really interesting to hear from such a variety of uh, perspectives. So uh, thank you so much. And I'd also just like to plug a quick advertisement as well. Um, if you were to and um, found the time to go on to the Yorkshire Process Industries um, IMEC division of the IMEC website, um, then you will find um, some interesting material. Um, one of them is a guide for anybody who's um, a mechanical engineer looking to get into the oil, gas and chemical industry. And there is also um, a working group that's being formed on the area of the skills gap that we are um, currently developing. Um, so again, feel free to reach out on that website if you'd be interested in being part of that. And finally, um, there is actually a, a survey that we are um, producing uh, from the IMECI, which is basically to get your perspective on the skills gap. Are there any, um, is there anything that you've tried of any examples that you've seen where the skills gap has been discussed and addressed in a really innovative way? So um, you can access that website by going onto the main IMECI website and looking for the Yorkshire Process Industry section. So if you've got any comments or anything to add, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>